Hey guys, how's it going? Sean here. And today we're going to talk about 3D printed molds. Now I've learned quite a bit over the past several months through trial and error um, and I want to share some of that knowledge with you so you don't have to make the same mistakes I made that ended up in some cases costing a bit of money. So let's go have some fun and take a look at what I've done. Here you can see some of my successes and some of my failures. Now these are all of the foam molds but I have made some rigid urethane molds as well that we'll touch on a little bit later in this video. I used the mold making first to make these foam giant Nerf rival balls with this uh, launcher you see here that, that was in my last video if you want to check that one out as well. It was a pretty cool video. It allowed me to do some really fun stuff with super slow motion on the Galaxy S9 like you see here. <laughs> and beans are a great slow motion uh, object. So the molding process with 3D printed molds is pretty straightforward, but there's a lot of little things you have to get right to make sure that your parts actually release from the molds instead of just gluing two molds together. And we're going to cover all that in detail throughout the rest of this video. Um, and whenever you're getting started, the first thing you have to be aware of is how to properly design molds, especially rigid urethane molds. This is a rigid urethane mold right here, and I'll talk in a lot of detail later in this video about all of the little things I've done to make it work. Um, obviously, then next you're gonna print the molds, which should be super straightforward because of the title of this video. After you printed, you apply some form of mold release, and this mold release that you use is gonna depend on the materials that you use, we obviously have to mix the material next so that we can begin filling our molds. And this is a pretty straightforward process, but there are a few little uh, items you gotta pay attention to while you're doing this. And we let it cure or expand if it's foam, which is obviously an, a simple process, but you do need to pay attention to some indicators. And we finally demold the parts carefully, I will add, especially depending on what the material you used was. So now let's talk about why would you use molding, why I used molding, um, and one of the reasons is because you can control your materials and colors and everything a lot better than 3D printing here. I have a two-tone part that I just added dye to change. You can also get really weird material properties. This is this filthy looking silicone um, koozie launcher thing that I made and it is the weirdest consistency ever, super floppy. You can also control the density. So this is tungsten powder that I used to fill the foam that I made my Nerf Rival Balls out of. And you can see that between the blue and the gray, I had like a 35% increase in density just by adding a little bit of tungsten to the mix. Now let's walk through this process with a lot more detail. And we begin with designing the molds, which you see here. So I always design the part first and then I put some geometry around it and use the combined functions in Fusion 360 to get the part that I uh, ultimately want to end up with on the mold side, which is a top and a bottom half. Um, I also put a cutout for removal. Now when I section it like this, you can see a lot more of what I've done. Um, I've, I've added draft angles. One thing that's important with these molds is you need to understand and plan for how you're going to fill and make sure that you don't have any undercuts on parts that are rigid because with rigid molds, you'll never get an undercut part out. Now, I put these keys in here so that I can align it. You can do this a lot of different ways, but that just lines the top and bottom half together so you don't have any shift. And when you look at the cross section here, you see I have what's called a draft angle. This is exaggerated to like six or 10 degrees, but I normally only do maybe a two to three degree draft, which helps you remove the part. Finally, you print the molds, which I don't have any tricks here. It's obvious how to print. You probably already know how to do that. So I'm just going to sneak in a please subscribe. Um, and thank you for clicking the subscription button. That helps me a lot. Now we prepare the molds, and this is extremely important. Um, and by that, I mean applying mold release. When I use silicon, I use Man Ease Release 200, and it works great. Um, some molds, mold release will actually act as a primer for silicon if you get the wrong one. For urethanes, I use Chapstick or Vaseline, and you see here, I am applying it to every region that I expect the uh, rigid urethane or foam urethane to contact. It doesn't matter if it's foam or rigid because urethane sticks really well to everything. You see here, I'm applying it to the inside of this mold as well. And I'm just gonna let it uh, level and then I, I'm ready to cast after this. Now, 
The next step is also pretty obvious. You mix the material, which you can do a bunch of ways, but it really depends on the material you're using. Here I have a material that's mixed by volume, so make sure you read your instructions. And if you're supposed to mix by volume, mix by volume with accurate measuring cups. But if you're supposed to mix by weight, like the silicon foam you see here, then you will need an accurate scale to be capable of mixing these guys by weight. And if it is foam, I want to point out that you don't have much time between mixing and filling the molds because it expands very quickly. So now that obviously brings us to filling the molds, which is either easy for rigid resin or a very quick process for foam. Here is the mold we walked through in the design process where I just filled it, poured it full, and then I put in the top half mold. Um, and now here's another example of me using my two tones. You can see I'm using a syringe with a, a fine point to fill in the S in the middle here. And what I'm doing here is just filling it till it's very level with the top. I don't want to over or underfill this. This is pretty particular and you want to do it on a relatively level surface. And once you have it most of the uh, way filled as you want it, you're going to let it cure for a little while so that when you pour in the other color, they don't mix. So what you can see here, the S is, looks a little cloudier, and that's because it started to cure. And so now I'm putting in what looks clear, but it cures white. And that's going to just fill in the rest of the mold and give me that cool two-tone look that I had earlier on in the video, and I'll show you that again as well. Now when it comes to the cure, I do this two different ways depending on if I'm working with foam or rigid materials. For foam, I'm going to let it completely expand and cure. And the way I check that is I look at the cup that I mixed it in and I actually remove the material in the mixing cup. And this helps me to know that it is fully cured or not. You can see it's fully cured here. Um, and I do that because the foam's not always super strong if it's not fully cured. Here's an example though of me overfilling a mold and during cure it expanded too much. With some of the rigid urethane molds, um, they start out clear like this one in the uh, two-tone example and I know they're, they're uh, cured when they turn white like this because this material actually starts clear and cures white. And once we've cured to the point that we are happy, we obviously go to the demolding which is the best part because you get to see what everything looks like now. And you really want to make sure, like I said, with foams that you're waiting until they're fully cured so that they don't tear in half when you remove it. Here's a good example of a part that molded really well. It's uh, silicon rubber in this case, and it pulls out pretty easy. Here's an example of me removing urethane foam, which it came out really good. You see what's called flashing here, and I just trimmed that off with a pair of scissors. Um, and also, here is an example of what happens when you don't put the right or enough mold release on. I had to completely destroy this mold to even get the part out. And it's the same one you saw in the uh, prior urethane foam video. So I'm having to hammer this thing and completely shatter it. And it really left me with a part that came out pretty poorly. It was poor surface and it was torn all over the place. So definitely use your mold release. And with the rigid materials like this, I usually try not to let them cure 100% because they're just a little bit easier to remove when they're not fully cured and they're still a little bit flexible. And they can be a challenge to get out much more so than foam because you still don't have that flexibility. So it definitely helps to have a few different tools at your disposal to help you remove these things. I like to use small pliers or tweezers on smaller parts to just kind of pull it away. And that's really all there is to it. Thanks everyone for watching. Um, if you have any questions about any step in the process or anything that maybe wasn't clear, please feel free to reach out to me or leave a comment and I'll get back to you as quickly as I can.